Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's International Dermatology Education Foundation Educational Series webinar. My name is Ashley with RBC Consultants, and we are looking forward to bringing you tonight's program titled Opsilura for Vitiligo, Achieving and Maintaining Repigmentation. As moderator this evening, we have Dr. James Del Rosso, Adjunct Clinical Professor, Dermatology, at Toro University, Nevada, Henderson, Nevada. Research Director, Principal Investigator, JDR Dermatology Research, Las Vegas, Nevada. Senior Vice President of Clinical Research and Strategic Development, Advanced Dermatology and Cosmetic Surgery, Maitland, Florida, and President of American, and Acne, American Acne and Rosacea Society. As speaker this evening, we have Dr. Eric Dominguez, Modern Dermatology of Massachusetts um, in Fall River, Massachusetts. We would like to thank our supporter this evening, Insight, for making this educational event possible. A couple of logistic tips before we begin. If you're having trouble hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit your questions in the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of the webinar, a survey will be emailed to you and we would greatly appreciate it if you could fill out this survey. And within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will also be emailed to you. Again, if you have any questions, please submit your questions using the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the floor virtually to Dr. Del Rosso. Thank you, Ashley. It's certainly a pleasure to have the opportunity to participate in this program. This evening, I'm Jim Del Rosso from Las Vegas, Nevada. I won't repeat the affiliations because Ashley was very kind uh, to mention all of those. And I am the stunt double for Leon Kersik tonight. He was not able to be here tonight. So I am filling in for him and I hope I can do as good a job as Leon does. Uh, as the leader of the International Dermatology Education Foundation, which provides a lot of educational programs, not only in the United States, but globally. Next slide, please. So we have had several sessions in, through IDEF, a variety of different topics, and there are more coming up. So make sure you pay attention to when they come in, because there are some excellent programs that are provided through this, uh, through this platform, through this company. And you can stay up to date with the IDEF Educational Series webinars and go ahead and go to social media and, and just let people know how you feel about it. I'm sure you're gonna be very happy about it. And you can register by going to the website below, www.ideficationalseries.com to register for any upcoming events. Next slide. So now it's a pleasure of mine to introduce someone that I've gotten to know over the past few years at different meetings. Uh, he does practice, he's in private practice at Modern Dermatology in Massachusetts in Fall River, Massachusetts. It's fall, so it must, it must be beautiful in that part of the country. He's homegrown. He's homegrown in Worcester, Massachusetts, where he did his undergraduate training. He went to medical school and his dermatology residency there. And he's assistant professor at the Department of Dermatology at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester. So he has a lot of ties to the University of Massachusetts, and I'm sure he's a Boston Red Sox fan, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk to Dr. Eric Dominguez to bring us up to date and give us his perspectives on Opsilura for vitiligo, achieving and maintaining repigmentation. We know this is a challenge, and we're looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Del Rosso. Yeah, you know, very happy to be here. And yes, you know, definitely a Red Sox fan. Didn't do too well this year, but that's okay. Uh, I'm very excited to be discussing Opsor for Vitiligo, achieving and maintaining repigmentation. Um, as a reminder, Opsor is the first and only FDA-approved topical treatment for non-segmental vitiligo in patients 12 years of age and older. A few disclosures. Certainly, of course, you know, this is a um, 
presentation uh, being presented by myself for insight and being compensated as a result. No pictures or screenshots, of course, during the speaker program. What we discuss today will be in accordance with US FDA approved indication for Opsilura. Only questions that are on label can be answered at this presentation. We will discuss important safety information and full prescribing information is available at this presentation. So just as a remi reminder again, Opsilura is indicated for the topical treatment of non-segmental vitiligo in patients 12 years of age and older. Although we're not discussing the other indication, which is for the short-term and non-continuous chronic treatment of mild to moderate atopic dermatitis, it is approved for that in patients that are non-immunocompromised, 12 years of age and older, whose disease is not adequately controlled with topicals or when those are not advisable. And use of Opsilura in combination with therapeutic biologics, other JAK inhibitors, or potent immunosuppressants such as azathioprine or cyclosporin is not recommended. So keep that in mind. So that's a limitation, correct, Eric? That's uh, yes, not listed is. as a contraindication, but it's a limitation because it wasn't studied, is my understanding, correct? Exactly, exactly. Yep, it's not a contraindication, just a limitation. Something to keep in mind, of course, using your clinical judgment whether you want to combine or not. Here's some important safety information. We're going to delve into this a little bit deeper later in the conversation. We know that Opsilura is a topical JAK inhibitor, and it was given the same box warning as oral JAK inhibitors. And these include these listed here, serious infections, higher rate of all-cause mortality, lymphoma, and other malignancies, MACE events, thromboses. But again, we're going to discuss these later, put them into context, and look at some of the long-term safety data for Opsilura for treatment of non-segmental vitiligo. So first we're gonna discuss vitiligo as a chronic autoimmune skin disease, discuss the burden of disease and how we manage vitiligo. So we know that vitiligo is classified based on clinical phenotypes. We have non-segmental vitiligo, which is the most common type of vitiligo, but then you also have uh, segmental vitiligo, which affects four to 16% of patients. Non-segmental vitiligo can br be broken up further into generalized, acrofacial, where you have involvement of the face and distal extremities, universal or focal. And you can see some photos here as well of this disease. When we see vitiligo, we can see any of these clinical phenotypes in our patients. However, segmental vitiligo typically is distributed on one side of the body with early hair follicle involvement. This progresses rapidly, then stabilizes. Typically a very difficult form of vitiligo to treat. And as a reminder, Opsilura is not approved for the treatment of segmental vitiligo, only for non-segmental vitiligo. And we know that vitiligo repigmentation occurs to varying degrees of success depending on body areas. We know that areas with higher density of hair follicles tend to repigment the best and the quickest. So this here is highlighted in blue. So you'd expect areas like your face, your arms, your legs, your abdomen, your back. Areas that typically repigment more slowly include those areas with lower density of hair follicles. So we know Classically, dorsal hands, dorsal feet, definitely areas that can take much longer to repigment. Other areas may not repigment at all, and these here are listed in pink or red. Those are areas where hair follicles are absent or very low in density, such as your palms, your soles, the volar wrists, genital sites, mucosal, semi-mucosal surfaces, and areas with leukotrichia. Now we're going to discuss the mechanism of disease of vitiligo and also Opsler's mechanism of action. So typically, you'll have a genetic predisposition, which along with some stressors to the melanocytes, such as chemicals, UV radiation, injury, and or unknown triggers, that combination together triggers stress on melanocytes, which results in immune cell activation, such as dendritic cells and macrophages, that then results in activation of CD8 positive T cells. And these are the T cells that are going to be targeting your melanocytes. But these CD8 positive T cells, when they're activated, they produce interferon gamma. That's what binds to the inter inter interferon gamma receptor on your keratinocytes, resulting in activation of the JAK STAT pathway, which then leads to more production of CXCL9 and 10, which are chemokines, which result in more recruitment of CD8 positive T cells. And those CD8 positive T cells are the ones that are cytotoxic and they result in destruction of your melanocytes and as a result, depigmentation. So we really have to stop this positive feedback loop where you produce CD8 T cells, 
they produce interferon gamma, it goes through the JAK-STAT pathway, results in more chemokines, more activation of CD8 cells, and you get more of that destruction of your melanocytes. So you really so want Eric, to decrease- I, ha I, I had a question for you. Please. So going back to what you were talking about with the repigmentation, do you find, because this has been found with some of the other autoimmune diseases that we have different therapies for, better therapies for now, the length of time that the patient has had the vitiligo, do you find that that influences the amount of response that they get? So it, it can vary. So I've seen patients who have obviously newer onset vitiligo that respond quicker than others. But I've had patients, and you'll see some photos here in today's presentation, where they may have had vitiligo for 20, 30 years, and they're still repigmenting. So it really can be very patient dependent. So I don't really use that. At, I really leave it up to the patient. You know, we have patients who come in all the time. They're not even here for vitiligo. I always mention it. And then I leave it to the patient. Would you like to treat? Many patients have been told their whole lives, there is nothing for your vitiligo. There's nothing to do. So they're not even aware of Opsilura. So I bring it up as a potential option. And if they're on board with trying something, then of course I'll mention Opsilura. We'll coach them through it and talk about the treatment regimen and what it takes. Uh, and if they're interested, we'll do it. If not, we'll just, you know, continue with a full skin exam that they're there for. Yeah. And, you know, I think what you said is really important because, you know, the patients that have had it for a longer period of time and maybe heard that there's no treatment and they're, they've sort of given up. But if they have vitiligo in areas that tend to repigment, where there are the terminal hairs and they can they can pigment repigment not only from the side but from the follicle, sometimes they do extremely well. So I think that's that, that encouragement is so important. Thank you. No, absolutely. No, definitely one of those things where I want to just get patients out of that mindset. And I think it's important to remind our patients that have had vitiligo for a long time that there is treatment now because again for years they were, were told there was nothing great so what are our treatment goals for vitiligo so of course we want to inhibit that autoimmune response if you decrease that inflammation you're going to decrease the destruction of melanocytes and allow them to repigment so then achieving repigmentation, right? So allowing time for melanocytes to repopulate and repigment the skin, either perifollicular or through marginal repigmentation, which we will discuss in a couple of slides. And then again, maintaining repigmentation. So once you maintain, regain that pigment, you wanna maintain it. And we know that resident memory T cells in the skin are the culprit for patients basically losing pigment again. Once they repigment, the memory T cells recognize, you know what, okay, we need to start act acting up again and destroying those melanocytes. So really calming down that inflammation and keeping those memory T cells in check will help our patients maintain their repigmentation. So it's not only turning off the process, you actually re have to rebuild the factories and get them to first be there in greater number and then produce the pigmentation. So it's somewhat different than some other diseases in that way. Absolutely. And it's really just setting that expectation where, you know, this is not, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, right? we definitely have the possibility of helping your vitiligo, but it's not going to be something you're going to see overnight. It can take weeks. It can take months. In some of my patients, it can take more than a year. And this is where, again, I was going to get to this a little later, but I'll mention now, taking photographs. Always get baseline photos. Patients forget how their vitiligo looked. And you'll see some of the photos where some of the changes are subtle. And if a patient did not have photos, they might not notice that. They're looking at these patches every day. They might not notice some of that marginal repigmentation. Perifollicular right. repigmentation can be a little more obvious because you see the little dots, but marginal, not as much. You'll see this in some of the photos where some patients could have easily given up much earlier and not had the results that they had later in the studies. So now we're gonna look at Opsilura, how does it work? So we talked about the interferon gamma produced by your CD positive T cells binding to the interferon gamma receptor. And what that does is it activates the JAK-STAT pathway, which then leads to you know, cytokines, chemokines, activation of CD8 positive T cells. Well, by Opsilura blocking or binding JAK1 and 2, it's stopping that process. So you're decreasing that inflammation, decreasing the increased production of CD8 positive T cells, and as a result, allowing a nice environment where those melanocytes can repigment and come back to life, right? Building up that factory and getting that factory going of melanocytes to then get that repigmentation. And as we discussed, repigmentation takes time, can take months. So I always set this expectation with my patients. I never promise them results in four to six weeks. No, absolutely not. Now, if someone were to get results that early, fantastic. But I would not expect that. Those would not be typical results. 
We know that repigmentation can be perifollicular or marginal. Most common, of course, is perifollicular, where I describe to those patients as polka dots. You'll see little dots of pigment within your patches of vitiligo. And this results from stem cell migration from your hair follicles to then go to the skin and mature into melanocytes. And this is important because the melanoblast reservoir in your hair follicle is an immune privileged location. So it does not have the interference from those CDA positive T cells that melanocytes would in the skin. And then marginal repigmentation is where the pigment comes from the sides, right? You have activation, migration, and proliferation of functional melanocytes from those lesional borders. And this is also where photos are very important because patients won't always see, excuse me, or notice shrinking of their vitiligo patches. So what's interesting about that is sometimes when people come back and they see the, the speckled pigmentation, the perifollicular, they're asking, um, is this the way it's going to look? Am I going to look speckled? And I, I'm asking you, I always tell them, hang in there. That's a really good sign. That's going to continue to come up and it's going to get more confluent. And on the marginal, the marginal is what I'll often see in those areas that tend to pigment less, but like on the, on the, on the some of the areas on the extremities, right? Um, and but they sometimes will pigment uh, pigment in from the side, and it could take longer. I love the idea about the photographs. That that's a very good tip because they don't they don't remember it or they don't notice it. They don't. And I will tell you, I've had patients who wanted to give up. And just by showing them photographs, the motivation factor was tremendous. So really, those photographs can really, you know, motivate a patient. And really, it's any change that they're looking for. Right. And again, you're not going to have them recheck photos in four weeks. Now, you know, it's one of those things where you give them time. Now, I have most of my patients come back in about two months after starting, really just to make sure that they haven't given up that they're still motivated, and that they're, of course, not having any sort of tolerability issues, which I don't typically expect, but I, of course, would like to go over that with them because I wanna make sure if there are any questions, any concerns, these patients can ask me anything at that point, right? We always leave the door open where you can call, but let's see you back in two months just to check in. I, I, I could think of some patients that were feeling like they were ready to give up and just encouraging them to hang up, hang on a little bit longer. They, they hang in for three or four months. They see a difference and they're very thankful. So true. Exactly. Exactly. So again, remember to educate your patients like we talked about. So now we're going to discuss the efficacy and safety profile of Opslura. There was the True V1, True V2 studies, which were two phase three randomized double blind studies in patients 12 years of age and older with non segmental vitiligo. Patients to be eligible for the study had to be at least 12 years of age, have non segmental vitiligo, have vitiligo areas affecting at least 0.5% of the facial body surface area and at least 3% of the non facial BSA have total body vitiligo area not to exceed 10% BSA. Now that's important because the on-label indication for Opsilura for non-segmental vitiligo is up to 10% BSA. And how I describe that to patients, I don't say BSA, I don't say body surface area, they have no idea, right? They're, they're not supposed to know that. I say it's 10 handprints, right? So one handprint is 1% BSA. 10 of those is 10%. When you put it in that context, patients get it, all right? Patients were also not allowed to use phototherapy during the clinical trial, and those with complete leukotrichia within any facial lesion were also excluded. And patients were randomized to receive either Opsilura monotherapy BID for 24 weeks or vehicle BID for 24 weeks. And at the 24-week mark, we had our primary endpoints, which were the proportion of patients achieving a 75% improvement in the facial vitiligo area scoring index, known as, known as f -Vase, okay? That's when they take into, the, into account the percentage of involvement of depigmentation and your degree of depigmentation. It's similar to your POSI score for psoriasis, your easy score for atopic dermatitis, but this is specifically for vitiligo. And then at week 24, they looked at that. That's your key primary endpoint. There were key secondary endpoints. We're looking at facial VASI 90, so 90% 90 improvement in your facial VASI score at week 24. F VASI 50, which is 50% improvement. T VASI 50, which is 50% improvement in your total body VASI score. 
all right? And then at week 52, you had your, then after 24 weeks, you have your open label extension. That's the second part of a clinical trial where primarily you're looking at safety and secondarily looking at efficacy as well. And patients then who are on Opsilura, maintained on Opsilura for 28 more weeks, or if they were on vehicle, they rolled over to Opsilura monotherapy BID. And we're looking here at FVASI 75, or total VASI 75 at week 52. And then we'll look at a further long-term extension study looking out to 104 weeks. But first, we're going to focus here on these first 24 weeks and 52 weeks. Look at some efficacy. Look at some uh, safety data as well for our patients with non-segmental vitiligo. Patient demographics, important things to get from here. Now, this is great, right? So average duration of disease since initial diagnosis, anywhere from zero to almost 61 years, all right? So I can think of some of my patients that I've had a discussion with. They're in their 70s. They've had vitiligo since they were teenagers. They would qualify. And of course, I will, and I have patients who, you know, qualify for that. They've had it for 50, 60 years. We're treating them. But the average duration was 14.8 years, which is still a, you know, large amount of time. The average affected total BSA was 7.4%. And the average facial BSA was 1%. And over 58% of patients had previous therapy. This could, of course, include anything from topical steroids to TCIs to steroids, phototherapy, whatever it may be. Um, three quarters of patients had stable disease, but 25% of patients have progressive disease. So keep that in mind. And we have a pretty good distribution here with skin phototypes as well. And looking here at a classic patient, so this is a week 24 patient from the clinical trial where about one in three patients at week 24 had a 75% improvement in their facial VASI score. So at VASI 75, one in three patients achieved this at 24 weeks. This patient here, you know, this is not a typical patient. At week 12, the patient has already achieved FOSI 75. They already have an 83% improvement in their FOSI score. So not typical, but obviously there are those occasional patients who do respond early. But again, I would not give up on this patient at week 12. I would not give up on this patient at week 24. I would keep going. And look, duration of disease, 38 years. All right, so 38 years in achieving that FOSI 75 score early on. And here we look you know, week Wilson, sometimes eric on, on a patient like that i don't know if you can go backward yes you will as good as she looks a lot of people are going to be really excited about the benefit but sometimes they'll come in and they'll focus on the areas that are not repigmenting and really not realize how much better they're going and the idea of continuing more and more in those other areas is so important but when you encounter that with a patient what what do you what do you say to them the patient that focuses on the negative areas yeah well i try to make the glass half full right so i look i show them the photos first of all i say look at this dramatic improvement look at your you know right cheek look at your you know right periorbital area even your left periorbital area those are better look at your forehead right it's almost resolved there on the forehead your left upper uh, eyelid and i focus on that positive and i say it's been 24 weeks and look at the tremendous progress you've made. We now know, and we'll show again later in this presentation, if you keep going, you're, you have a good chance of getting even better. Give it time. There are some people that do not see these results until a year at least, right? Right. So definitely right. staying with that. And just really, again, this is where us as clinicians, we have to really do our part to motivate our patients and just, again, know that this takes longer. Right. And again, and, I totally agree with Dr. Russell. Room, or even after we leave, our staff, they ask the questions too. Our staff have to be on the same page with that because if they're somewhat nonchalant about it, the patient may pick that up and not be encouraged. So everybody in the office has to be on the same page. I'm sure you do that. I'm sure Absolutely. Oh, yeah. my, my staff sees how I do things and they know oh, this is what Dr. Dominguez says, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And we're all on the same page because we want to really motivate our patients to stay on treatment because this is really reassuring but i totally agree with you I, you know you can see somebody of course focusing on you know what oh i still got this on my forehead it's a very visible area but then we of course have to kind of show you know but look it's a lot better so just keep going let's keep going with this let's follow up in a few weeks and see where things are keep taking photos great so here we can see those numbers right so at week 24 30 percent of patients are achieving f 75 now this is the first 24 weeks. As we talked about in that open label extension, patients were allowed to treat for another um, 28 weeks, right? Up to 52 weeks. 
Now, one thing to keep in mind with any open label treatment extension is that there can be a little bit of enrichment of the long-term data. Essentially, patients who either weren't responding or may have had a tolerability issue, et cetera, will drop out of the study. So sometimes numbers can be a little higher than what they are. That's, again, across the board with any sort of clinical trial with an open label treatment extension. With that being said, it's still good to see these numbers here that at week 52, one in two patients have 75% improvement in their FVASI score. Okay, very important to see that. So you can expect that half of your patients have at least you know 75% improvement of their facial non-segmental vitiligo. And we're going to see this. But you're still going to have other ones that had 60% improvement or 58%. They need to keep going. They need absolutely. To keep Absolutely. And that's where some of the data that we're going to show will, will demonstrate that. You know, we're going to see some photos as well where we could see patients giving up early if they were, again, coached appropriately on how this disease is. And I think if we think about the mechanism of action, how we need to you know, replace and restore that melanocyte reservoir, it makes total sense why it takes a long time. Here's a patient who achieved f 75 at week 52. So look here, at week 24, they have not yet achieved the ref Fozzy 75, right? They're 44% improved. But again, photos here are tremendous. Look at the peri oral area. You see some marginal repigmentation, some peri follicular repigmentation. This is a patient that if you didn't coach them and didn't take photos, they'd say, you know what, doc? I'm not better. I'm going to give up. And I wouldn't have waited 24 weeks to see them anyways. I would have seen them a little bit sooner. But this is someone I'd say, listen, stay with it. And here you can see at week 52, 78% improvement in their facial VASI score, uh, which again would be a tremendous you know, success for this patient. You know, because again, still I would not stop. Week 52, 78% better. I'm not ready to quit. Let's keep going. I want 90, I want 95, I want to get close to 100. And again, coaching your patient, really helping them stay you know, on the drug, helping them you know, stay motivated. Sorry, we're trying to advance the slide here. There we go. Here's a patient now. At, oh, sorry, we're going too far back. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So here's a patient from the clinical trials at week 24, we're achieving f 50 Okay, so f 50 of course, a little string, less stringent criteria. So about one in two patients will achieve this at 24 weeks. So 50% improvement in their f score. Look at the baseline photo. Look at week 12. So the patient already on the cheeks having some perifollicular repigmentation and some marginal repigmentation. Certainly not someone who's going to be satisfied enough with those results. By week 24, those cheeks are looking a lot better, right? So they're having, se so again, this is 73% change. So it's not f 75 because they're not 75% better. They're under that. So it's technically f 50 by week 12 and then maintaining that at week 24. And again, this is someone that I would continue on the medication, continue them, you know, longer term to really see how they do. Again, it's only 24 weeks and 24 weeks was looked at as the time point that they wanted to use due to the fact that vitiligo takes longer to repigment. That's why we're not looking at, you know, week 12, week six, week eight, et cetera. It was week 24 that was decided upon. f 50 now through week 52. So we can see here again, same type of potential, you know, um, you know, open label extension, uh, you know, uh, issues with enrichment or whatnot. You'll see that again for all of them. I'm not going to keep repeating that. But 75% of patients in the open label treatment extension at one year, so three out of four, achieving f 50 So 50% improvement in their facial VASI score. So again, that curve keeps going up. So again, I would not stop. I would keep going, keep motivating. Here's a patient with, as you can imagine, some quite distressing non-segmental vitiligo involving the glabella, extending onto the periorbital area, upper cutaneous lip, the nose, the cheek. At week 24, so think about the six months in, only 10% better. Now you can see there's certainly some change. There's some perifollicular repigmentation, some marginal repigmentation, but if you stay with it for the full 52 weeks, you've definitely accomplished some change here, right? So 60% improved. Now, is this patient going to be satisfied? Am I going to be satisfied with these results so far? No. Am I encouraged? Absolutely. So I definitely would continue the patient on uh, Opsilura, uh, you know, past the 52 weeks. Here's a patient with almost complete depigmentation of their face, right? Forehead, periorbital, nose, cheeks, chin. 
going down to the neck. And by week 12, 72% improvement in their facial VASI score. All right, a lot of facial perifollicular repigmentation, some marginal repigmentation, and then by week 24, 91% improved. So F VASI 90. So a much more stringent criteria, similar to your POSI 90s for psoriasis, easy 90 for atopic derm, but here F VASI 90 for the facial repigmentation. And we can expect that one in six patients at week 24 will see 90% improvement in their facial VASI score. And again, this is a patient with vitiligo for almost 22 years. So a significant time period and still having these results. And again, I've said it before, and I'm gonna keep saying it tonight because I really wanna get the point across. This is the importance of taking photos. This is the importance of motivating our patient. This is a patient who in my clinic, I would expect after my coaching will be very motivated to continue treating because they've come this far. There's no stopping them. You know, really wanna continue treating with Opsilura. Now look at FBOSI so 90. That particular yep, patient that had the speckling, you know, some people like that, like, am I gonna look speckled like this? And that's where you gotta remind them, no, this this is a really, really good sign. I'm very happy about it. It means it's working really well, just give it longer. And I have not seen that not spread out into more confluent in, uh, pigmentation in any patient with that type of perifollicular. Absolutely. Has that been, what's been your experience? My experience is when I see that those polka dots, I call them polka dots with my patients because that's how they get it, right? You know, um, the, the, the excitement that they see that I get, it, like they, they're, they're, I think, even more motivated to keep treating because they see how excited I am about it. And I say, listen, this is great news, right? You're responding. This is just going to keep filling in. So let's keep with it, right? You're going to get pigment coming from the sides, more pigment coming from your hair follicles. These are really good results, even just a few perifollicular repigments, right? Even yep. just a few will definitely, you know, be motivating for me and for my patients. And again, again, you've got to really set those expectations. You need to know what to look for. You need to know what to tell your patients. And I think if we do that, we can certainly repigment a lot of our patients, um, you know, typically to a success level that we're looking for. You know, you know here my we staff see... will often tell them that before I walk in the room. Oh, that's a really good sign. They're getting yeah. that backup from everybody because it's true. You Absolutely. Know, it's, it's, you're not spinning it. It's true. Exactly. And, you know, I will say I see a lot of adolescents as well with vitiligo. And that's an even more important thing. We know our adolescents are sometimes the patients that sometimes have trouble maintaining, you know, treatment twice a day, every day. And you really have to you know, coach them through it. You know, I have some patients that have treated once a day because they forget and they're already starting to see results. And I say, look at this. If you use this twice a day, just imagine the results that you have. You know, the on-label indication is twice a day indefinitely up to 10% BSA. So I tell patients, you want to use this twice a day every day. You know, once a day, okay, maybe you'll, you'll see some results, but it really has to be twice a day because that's really the way that it's indicated uh, for its usage. Here we can see at 52 weeks, one in three patients is achieving 90% improvement in their facial VASI score. So again, you know, we have patients that certainly can get much better, quicker results than others, some slower, some quicker. Um, it's very unpredictable, as you can see, based on time course. It could be 10 years repigmenting slower. It could be 50 years repig repigmenting quicker. Every patient's different. Here's an adolescent. So, you know, good segue. I just discussed an adolescent patient of mine. Here's someone who, at baseline, as you can imagine, you know, 14-year-old young lady, you know, something here that of course with type 4 skin so definitely more obvious their depigmentation could be quite bothersome right around the eyes around the mouth the nose but by week 24 so quick results 90 percent improvement but we're still not done at week 52 they are essentially completely repigmented right so 99 percent change they have a little bit left over near the mouth but they you know otherwise uh, pretty pretty well repigmented. As you can imagine, something that would be ecstatic for a patient, especially of this age. And I have patients who are just like this, where you really have to coach them through. Yes, some will respond quickly like this and respond well. Others will take six, 12, or longer, more months to really see the change that we and the patients want to see. And this is where we're also getting the parents on board, right? So the parents, you know, we don't want the parents to be nagging the kids either, right? Obviously, because some, you know, some adolescents won't want to use it. But just really getting the parents to also coach and be supportive can also be quite helpful for our adolescent patients with uh, non-segmental vitiligo. Now we're going to be looking at body non-segmental vitiligo. So this is the total VASI 50. So we're looking for 50% improvement in the total body, total body VASI score, right? So here's a patient, back of the neck, the leg and the knee. At baseline, of course, you know, quite 
uh, you know, large patches of de uh, depigmentation. By week 12, you're already seeing a ton of that speckle, that those polka dots, the perifollicular repigmentation. You can even see some marginal repigmentation coming in from the edges as well. So photographs, very important. Now, again, these are quick results, early results. Uh, I would keep on going, obviously. Week 24, again, 52% better, but demonstrable results compared to even week 12. And of course, much better results compared to baseline. And we can expect that one in four patients will have these results at 24 weeks. But again, I would continue going. I would not stop at 24 weeks. I would continue going twice daily uh, uh, for our patients uh, with these types of responses. But again, uh, something that's great here for the 16-year-old adolescent uh, female. And we can see here through week 52, we can expect possibly one in two patients achieving 50% improvement in their total body VASI score. Again, that's part of the open label treatment extension. So again, you may have those limitations as we discussed earlier, but again, still good to see those numbers because I do continue my patients easily through 52 weeks with Opsilura. Now, this is a great photo, right? This is a clinical trial patient, very difficult area to treat. So you have the dorsal hand, one of those areas that I certainly tell my patients can repigment very slowly. Before we had Opsilura, we knew this could repigment slowly. With Opsilura, we know that it still can, but it is an area that we do see repigmentation in a lot of our patients to varying degrees. So if you look at the photo here, just specifically of the hand, not, you know, not very obvious changes at week 24, right? You can see some changes though. If you look here at the photos, you will see some marginal repigmentation. So it is getting a little bit smaller, right? Even the finger is a little bit better approximately. And then by week 52, you have a 65% improvement. So this is where photos are very important. Again, these are not dramatic results that you see on someone's face, for example, or other areas with high hair follicle density. The so dorsal hands, dorsal feet just don't have that. So we're not going to expect that as much, but you really, again, want to coach your patients. Look at the abdomen, right? Baseline, you have these depigmented patches on the abdomen. If you look at week 24, you can easily expect or see this from a patient who, if you didn't take photos, they may say, Doc, I haven't really seen a difference. But look at that. Look at all that perifollicular repigmentation in all of those patches, right? Even some of the patches have resolved almost completely. But again, a patient might not see that if you don't, excuse me, take photos because, again, they're looking at this every single day. So those photos are tremendous when coaching our patients and really keeping them motivated. And then by week 52, 65% improvement, right? So again, you really want to coach your patients, take photos, 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 photos. I cannot stress the importance of photos. If you have an EMR that has photos, uh, photo capability, use that. If not, take photos with the patient's phone, right? That's obviously then going to be HIPAA compliant. You don't have to worry. It's on the patient's phone. And then every time they come in, you can take more photos. They can create a little collage and look at photos side by side. I have done that with patients who want to look at photos themselves. We have an EMR that has photo capability, so we do that. But we'll take photos with, with the patient's phone if necessary as well. Now, we've obviously shown that Opsilura through 52 weeks is efficacious at repigmentation of non-segmental vitiligo, whether it be the face or the body for a good proportion of our patients. But what about our adverse events? Of course, we know that it's effective for most of our patients, but how about safety? Well, we wanna look at our treatment emergent adverse events, so TEAs at 24 weeks. So here you can see acne, pruritus, nasopharyngitis, headache, UTI, erythema, pyrexia. You can see the corresponding rates in the vehicle. When you look at adverse events, you also have to look at how many patients are discontinuing the medication because of these. Well, as you can see here in the TRUV1 study, 0.5% of patients discontinued Opsilura and 0.9% discontinued vehicle. So our patients are doing well, right? They're, not many are discontinuing. 0.4% are discontinuing in TRUV2 versus 0% for Opsilura. So it's good to see those numbers because certainly when we're prescribing Opsilura, we also want to keep safety in mind uh, since, again, it is a topical JAK inhibitor. It's good to see this data here. And we're going to look at more long-term data through two years, which is also important because, of course, some adverse events, 24 weeks is not enough time to look at safety. We really want to look at the long-term data as well. Here we can see, again, at 52 weeks, no additional safety signals, right? So really nothing new through 52 weeks. You know, a couple of things I'll point out. Yeah, COVID-19, yep, that's increased. Well, not really a surprise. Any of the medications that were studied during the COVID pandemic, we would expect COVID-19 to be elevated uh, in, in patients. Um, but again, no serious 
TEAEs were considered by the investigators to be related to treatment. So another thing to keep in mind, but again, no additional safety signals. So nothing new from the first 24 weeks that we saw through 52 weeks. Now we're gonna pivot a little bit. So we've completed now 52 weeks of Opsilura. We have the parent study, the open label extension. Now we're gonna look at the True V long-term extension study, which is a phase three rollover study from True V1 and True V2. So again, here's True V1 and True V2, the 52 weeks. We're gonna have two cohorts. We're gonna have your maintenance of repigmentation cohort, which is cohort A. These are patients who had achieved at least f 90 in the parent study, okay? Some of those were continued, continued on Opsilura BID. Others were withdrawn. And the reason they withdrew was to see how many of these patients lost f 75 response. A caveat here is, however, if you lost f 75 response, you were then allowed rescue treatment with Opsilura BID. And then you looked at, well, if you lost f 75 response, how quickly did you regain your repigmentation? And that's important because as we saw, some patients can take 24 weeks, 52 weeks to repigment, and some may take even longer. Another cohort, cohort B, was your long-term efficacy and safety cohort. Right? So these were the patients who were continued on Opsilura throughout the whole study for another 52 weeks. These are patients that had not achieved f 90 So if you continue on Opsilura past 52 weeks, how many now respond and achieve success? And of course, looking at safety as well, again, for that 104 weeks to look at that long-term safety data. And the primary endpoints for cohort A were time to relapse. So when did you relapse, right? When did you lose your f 75 A key secondary endpoint was the time to maintain your f 90 response in cohort A. Secondary endpoints were those patients who were achieving f 75 or 90 in cohort B those achieving TVASI 50 in cohort B, and then of course the frequency and severity of adverse events. And then as we discussed, the other endpoint was the time to regain repigmentation in those patients who had relapsed in the withdrawal arm of cohort A. So now we're gonna focus on cohort A. So again, these are the patients who um, had achieved f 90 who either continued on Opsilura or withdrew to receive vehicle and had rescue treatment with Opsilura. Well, here we can see that among those patients who had reached f 90 at 52 weeks, more patients, so 62%, versus those who withdrew maintained their repigmentation. So if you withdrew, you had a good chance of not maintaining that repigmentation. If you continued, you had a good a chance of maintaining your f 90 response. However, 24% who had uh, continued on Opsilura may have lost f, f 90 response, but if you withdrew, over 50% lost their f, f 90 response. So what this supports is maintaining your patients on Opsilura even once they've achieved the results that you want, right? And again, these are patients that just dropped out or did not follow protocol. And we talked about this, pigmentation after relapse. So now you've stopped Opsilura, you've now gone below f 75 you've gone back on retreatment with Opsilura BID, how quickly do you regain repigmentation? So 75% of patients regained f 75 or higher within a median of 12 weeks, okay? 69% regained f 90 within a median of 15 weeks. So we're seeing here quicker response. So the reassuring thing here is, if for some reason you want to discontinue Opsilura once you achieve your f 90 or higher, per these numbers and per the study here, it will require less time to repigment than it did initially. So we're not seeing a median of 12 weeks or a median of 15 weeks in the first phase of the study. We're seeing 24 weeks, 52 weeks, but here we're seeing patients at 12 weeks achieving f 75 once they resumed Opsilura or f 90 within 15 weeks. So reassuring, the way that I use it in my clinical practice, once you've repigmented, our patients are so used to treating it, they're happy with the results, I just keep going, right? But if so, a patient wants to have a drug holiday, it's good to have this data in mind. So Eric, uh, it being a median, that means that some people were quicker. That's the midpoint. Exactly. Some exactly. people took longer. But if the people that took longer, let's say the 12-week group, you know, it's not like it took them a full year after that. It just took them, maybe took them longer, but they were seeing repigmentation, so they kept going, correct? 
Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, you know, and this is great for those patients who want to take a drug holiday or you're like, you know what, I'm doing well. Um, I'm happy. I'm going to stop it. I know the risks, right? I know the risks of depigmentation because I do tell them you have a good chance of repigmenting and repigmenting, repigmenting quicker, but you may not, right? You may be a patient that's, you know, an outlier who does not. So it's really good to just, you know, again, educate our patients. But the way that I look at it is with my patients, they've been treating now a lot of them for six, 12, 18 months, if not longer, they're used to using it. And if they have just localized areas that they were treating, you know, just their face, they've been tolerating it well, just continuing it in their problem areas on their face. You know, most patients really don't have an issue with that. And if they stop, again, we have this data to support that they have a good chance of repigmenting. It's just obviously not a guarantee because everyone is different. I try to encourage them if, if they're not totally, if they just say, I think I want a drug holiday. I try to encourage them not to, but if they really want to, yeah. But it's always better if they stay on it. Exactly. And I, and I put the memory T cell, you know, idea into, you know, layman's term to say, listen, you have these cells in your skin that we've pretty much put to sleep, all right? These cells want to destroy your pigment producing cells. If you stop Opslura, those cells are going to be, you know, come out of dormancy. They're going to reactivate again, and they're going to want to attack your pigment producing cells. So we really want to keep them asleep, keep them dormant, you know, and it's a good analogy to give to patients because then they can contextualize it a little bit and really understand what's going on. Because again, being non-medical, our patients, a lot of them, they're really not going to get that. You know, I'm better. Oh, it's great. It's resolved. They don't understand that vitiligo is a chronic autoimmune skin disease. You know, it's chronic. Just because you're repigmented doesn't mean it just stops happening, right? We have to, and again, educate our patients, know that mechanism of disease, and really be able to explain it in layman's terms to our patients. So now we're going to go over to cohort B. So these are patients who had not achieved f 90 at week 52, and they were continued on Opslura BID for 52 more weeks. And what's the premise of these line graphs? Well, basically, if you stayed with Opsalura BID for 52 more weeks, you continue to see further repigmentation. You increased your f 75 percentages, f 90, total f 50. So this really supports what I do with my patients when I counsel them and coach them to remain on Opsalura past one year if we have not achieved the results that patient and myself have been looking for. So keep going. Keep going. You see, these lines keep going up, and it's really just to see that and, you know, mention that to our patients who may be frustrated or have not truly seen the results at one year that they were expecting. Here's a patient, for example. So this is a great patient. So baseline, you know, significant depigmentation of the neck, the uh, perioral area, uh, nose. Week 24, right? 20% improvement. They have not achieved the primary endpoints. Week 52, one year now achieving 50% improvement. Again, this is where photos are important, all right? You can see obviously some improvement here. That chin has a lot of perifollicular repigmentation. The neck has marginal and perifollicular repigmentation, but again, only 50% better. This is a classic patient of someone that I would continue. This patient has had non-segmental vitiligo for almost 43 years. So someone who clearly had been told probably over the years, there's nothing to do. This is someone that you, you, know, you talk in the office to and you say, you know what? Does it, your vitiligo bother you? And you consider obviously Opsalura. And look at here, after two years, 94% improvement. So they achieved f 90 after not even achieving f 75 at one year. Okay. Do you find so, the neck a tougher area in some people? I do. I, I do. I, I think neck, you know, it's surprising, right? Because obviously there are a lot of hair follicles there. I find that it's definitely repigments slower than the face in my experience. But I find that if you do stay with it, it does get there eventually. But it does take time. It certainly does take time. Uh, it, it, I, I tell patients, because my patients who have facial vitiligo, a lot of times have neck involvement. And I do explain, you know, I expect in my experience that your face will repigment the fastest. Your neck yep. will get there, but don't be discouraged if your neck does not respond as quickly as your face. It really can right. take some time. And again, this is a patient that I would continue coaching through it. Their face is 94% improved. Their neck is better. But again, I would still keep going. I would still keep going. And they would be motivated to do so because they've seen those results on the face. And then again, you know, keep, I, I would try to get them to that point where they don't have to hide their vitiligo with a turtleneck anymore, like they're doing here at week 104, you know, so really keep them, you know, motivated to treat. Here's another patient. 
um, clinical trial uh, participant, 56 years old, on the uh, ventral forearm. As we discussed earlier, the ventral wrist, right, is an area that can be more difficult to repigment, and that's clearly seen here. You're seeing the forearm pretty much completely repigment. However, that wrist is definitely taking a little bit longer. Is it better? Absolutely. Is it where we want it to be? Not yet. I would keep going, and, and again, something that I would have set an expectation for. We know the wrists can be an area that takes a little bit longer to repigment. And this is someone here who had not achieved f 90 at week 52, but at week 104 did achieve that. And here's a patient, 23-year-old on the posterior thighs. You see no results really at week 24. Week 52, not seeing much. I would not give up, keep going. But look at that, week 80, peripheral repigmentation. Is this patient where they wanna be? Where I want them to be? No. Would I keep them motivated? Absolutely. Keep them going. Again, these photos are important to really show them the difference. And again, this is someone that, as you can imagine, at week 52 might be a little difficult to keep motivated. But if you know what you're, you know, mentioning to your patients, if you keep them motivated, talk about it, coach them through it, I think you can definitely, you know, wait it out. And, and a lot of our patients will see these results uh, likely. Now, here are our treatment emergent adverse events. At 104 weeks, we talked about new, no new safety signals through 52 weeks. Well, no new safety signals through week 104, all right? So pretty evenly matched here for cohort A, cohort B. You can see the respective numbers as well for vehicle where you have some cases of the same issues as well. Uh, so the safety data here was consistent with the phase three studies. So good to not see any sort of additional safety signals through two years of data. Now we're going to address the box warning. So the box warning comes from the, from the post-marketing oral surveillance study involving Zeljans for rheumatoid arthritis. Now keep in mind, Opsor is a topical JAK inhibitor, not FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis. It is only FDA approved for mild to moderate AD and non-segmental vitiligo. But patients who received Zeljans who had at least one cardiovascular risk factor and were at least 50 years of age and older who received Zelgians plus methotrexate had a higher risk of serious conditions when compared to TNF blocker plus uh, methotrexate, all right? And these include, you know, we're gonna go through these here, obviously important to mention these. Um, I like to mention these to patients, putting them in context, of course, with our patients. I mentioned to patients that we have to keep things on label, 10% body surface hairs, again, 10 handprints max. And I do mention these to our patients because our patients will go home and they'll pull out their insert and they will read these. So it is important to mention these. I like to also mention the oral surveillance study as well when I do discuss this. When you look at the box warning, you're gonna see a lot of reference to an oral JAK inhibitor used for the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis, all right? So some of these include your serious infections, so active TB, invasive fungal infections, bacterial viral infections, including herpes zoster. You should really avoid use of Opsura in patients with an active serious infection, including localized infections. If a serious infection develops, stop Opsura and then use your clinical judgment and discuss the benefits and risks prior to reinitiating Opsilar once the in infection is resolved, all right? Closely monitor your patients for the development of signs and symptoms of infection during and after treatment with Opsilar. We did discuss, obviously, serious lower respiratory tract infections in the clinical trial program with topical ruxolitinib. No active cases of TB were, were reported in clinical trials with Opsilar. Consider evaluating your patients for latent or active TB prior to administration of Opsilar. So use your clinical judgment, how you'd like to proceed with that. Viral reactivation, including cases of herpes virus reactivation, such as herpes zoster, have been reported in clinical trials with JAK inhibitors. Um, if a patient develops herpes zoster, interrupt Opsilar. Treat the herpes zoster. We're all adequately trained to do so, and then consider resuming afterwards. Um, Opsilar should not be initiated in patients with active hep B or hep C. So one of those things you definitely want to screen your patients for, all right? Here are our exposure-adjusted incidence rates of select treatment emergent adverse events from baseline to week 104. So these are those adverse events of interest, those that are listed in the boxed warning, those that, of course, came about because of the oral surveillance study. You're going to see here your events per 100 person years. 
So these are the number of events that would occur if 100 patients used Opsilura for one year. So you can see here the Opsilura numbers and the vehicle numbers. You have your serious infections, 0.5, opportunistic infections, and TB, zero, herpes zoster, 0.2, mortality, zero, lymphoma, zero, non-melanoma skin cancers, 0.1. So I recommend, you know, every year, give your patients a skin check who, have, who are on Opsilura. You know, you should really be, you're checking their skin anyways to look for their improvement. You're using a Woods lamp to look at their skin, to look for their, you know, for the re, repigmentation, et cetera. So just, you know, screen those patients. Other malignancies, excluding lymphomas and non-melanoma, 0.3, MACE events, zero, cardiac ventricular thrombosis, 0.1, and TIA, 0.1, all right? So again, these are good numbers to see through week 104. Um, because of course some of these events can take a little bit longer to develop so looking at these through two weeks is important and it's good to see these numbers here uh, but again still keeping your box warning uh, in mind so the less than one patient for a hundred patients over the course of the year that had any of those even the vehicle group had some right? exactly yep yeah. right. and you know it, it's they're good numbers to see you know obviously we know that the adverse rates observed in clinical trials and long-term studies may not predict the rates right they always mention that uh, but I think it's reassuring to see these numbers. But again, still, you know, would I prescribe this medication for a patient who has an active malignancy? No, I wouldn't, right? You know, and if a patient really wanted to, I would get clearance from an oncologist. That's how I would proceed. Have I prescribed uh, Opsler to patients with a previous history of malignancy? I have. But again, that's my clinical judgment. You know, it's one of those things you have to keep that in mind when you're prescribing these for your patients. I prescribe a lot of oral JAK inhibitors. So of course I prescribe a ton of topical JAK inhibitor. And you do that again in context, you know your patients, you screen them, you look at their medications, you look at their medical history, and you find out you know, the risks and benefits and discuss that with your patients. You know, more of the you know, boxed warning, of course, you're gonna see here again, that large randomized post-marketing study, high risk of mortality in those patients. You're gonna look at malignancies. You know, malignancies were reported in patients treated with Opsilor. We just showed you that that's a small number there. Um, but we can see here lymphoma and other malignancies observed in patients receiving JAKs used to treat inflammatory conditions. Again, in RA patients treated with an oral JAK inhibitor, et cetera. And again, if your patients are current or past smokers, it, that's an increased risk. So something to consider. Have I started Opsilura in patients who are smokers? I have, but I do have that discussion. I do mention that box warning as a result. These patients are at increased risk of malignancies, heart attack, right, MACE events, stroke, et cetera, because of their smoking. So I definitely want to mention that if I'm putting them on a medication that has a box warning, all right, because they already have a baseline increased risk. Uh, so again, consider your benefits and risks prior to initiating Opsilura, knowing, you know, the malignancy history prior or uh, current, and of course, current or past smokers, non-melanoma skin cancers we discuss. So I tell patients, you know, to obviously get their annual skin cancer screening, you know, apply sunscreen and use sun protective clothing, which I think we do for all of our patients as good dermatologists anyways. MACE events here again, that disclosure for your RA patients 50 years of age and older within at least one cardiovascular risk factor. So again, if a patient develops an MI or stroke, discontinue Opsilura, right? That's, that's pretty common sense. Uh, if a patient has a history of uh, cardiovascular events, you know, consider the risks and benefits. Have that discussion with your patient, uh, obviously. And if they're current or past smokers, we know that that risk is obviously much elevated. Same goes for thromboembolic events. Um, if symptoms of thrombosis occur, discontinue Opsilura and treat appropriately. And then use your clinical judgment whether to resume Opsilura or not. Uh, at that point, of course, if a patient has a stroke or another serious thromb thromboembolic condition, they may not want to, or they may want to. Um, again, use your clinical judgment. We are all clinicians. We have these discussions with our patients, and uh, we should be aware of these since they are in the box warning. I know, you know, some patients will certainly read the, you know, the insert word for word. Other patients will just, you know, listen to our advice and, uh, you know, expect us to discuss these potential, um, you know, issues. So how do you dose and administer Opsilura? Right? So this is a non steroidal cream that can be used anywhere on the body, including the eyelids, right? So sensitive skin areas, including around the eyes, the mouth, and the external genitals. Now it is for topical use only. It should never be used for ophthalmic, oral, or intravaginal use. So keep that in mind. Otherwise, you can apply it anywhere. Thin layer, I explained as one of my mentors did in residency, Dr. Sharp, right? So he always said, 
It's butter on toast. It's not cream cheese on a bagel, right? So a thin layer. Now, if a patient goes and says, well, I like a lot of butter, well, I say use less butter, right? So it's a thin layer twice daily to the affected areas up to 10 handprints. I always say 10 handprints for my patients. For us, for us clinicians, it's 10% total BSA. And a patient should not use more than one 60 gram tube per week. If you're not evaluating your patients early on like I do, they really should be evaluated at 24 weeks. And if there is no repigmentation, you should, of course, discuss the risks and benefits of continuing. Now, I would continue. I see my patients after two months, again, to coach them, to motivate them, to alleviate any concerns they may have and find out if they're having any issues with Opsilura, okay? Uh, but otherwise, then I see them back. So after two months, see them back at six months and then pretty much every three months thereafter or sooner if I find that they need extra coaching. And we've discussed this now multiple times. I think one of the biggest things we talked about was setting expectations for your patients. So counseling your patients. We know that Opsilura is the only FDA approved treatment for non-segmental vitiligo, but that repigmentation takes time. Adherence is key twice daily every day. You brush your teeth twice a day, you put this on twice a day, okay? Some areas repigment faster than others as we discussed, right? So hands, dorsal hands and feet will take the longest. Your face, in my experience, is the quickest. Other areas can vary depending on the patient. And some may not repigment at all. Follow up is key. I, I already discussed how I follow up two months, six months, nine months, 12 months, keep going, sometimes even a little more often. And then treat for maintenance. Even once you're repigmented, continue off Solera. We know that if you discontinue it, typically repigmentation is quicker. However, it's not a guarantee. So I definitely tell my patients to continue. And again, here's more important safety information. We know that thrombocytopenia, anemia, and neutropenia have been reported in clinical trials with Opsilera. Monitor as clinically indicated. Lipid elevations have occurred with oral ruxolitinib. Monitor as clinically indicated. We discussed the adverse reactions occurring in non-segmental vitiligo. Others listed for atopic dermatitis, which we did not discuss today, are listed here, occurring in at least 1% of patients. Um, Opsilera should not be used intentionally in your pregnant or lactating patients. However, if you have a patient who is on Opsilera and becomes pregnant, it is important to report them to the pregnancy registry. This is how we know if medications are safe in pregnancy. With that being said, I do not recommend Opsilera during pregnancy. If a patient uh, is pregnant, we discontinue. If they're planning pregnancy and actively trying, we have that frank discussion that they should either discontinue if there's a good chance they could become pregnant soon or, you know, discuss, you know, discontinuing immediately once they know they're pregnant. But either way, that's a discussion you have to have as a clinician with your patients. And of course, advise your patients that are lactating to not use Opsilura. Uh, and for approximately four weeks after their last dose, they should not breastfeed. This is something you can discuss now with your local uh, representative regarding uh, getting officer covered for your patients. Important things to document for your prior authorization in your documentation. Patient has to be 12 years of age and older. That is the on-label approval. They have to have non-segmental vitiligo, not, so, not segmental. ICD-10 code L80. Step-through therapies, right? Most of our patients have already been on topical steroids. Many have been on TCIs. List those. In my neck of the woods, if you've tried topical steroid and TCI, which pretty much all have, at some point, we get Opsilura pretty easily covered. Again, this can vary across the country, so discuss that with your representative. And the BSA, no more than 10%. So if your note says 20%, you're probably not going to get it covered. The on-label indication is 10%. BSA. So keep that in mind. There is the copay savings program. There obviously are several local and national specialty pharmacies that you can use as well. We have our, a couple local ones that we use up here. And there's the Opsilura on track patient support program as well with a bridge program, PA support, and patient resources. The QR code is here if you would like further information on that. So that being said, if they have more than 10% body surface area, what I think is important is ask them the areas that bother them the most. So you 100%. focus, it's usually gonna be the face, back of the hands, which is tougher, but you still treat them. Uh, so go to where the, where the, cause sometimes the patients will, may surprise you and where they prefer to have their treatment. I don't know. hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. So, you know, I, I've treated vitiligo now for many years. I, I love treating vitiligo and it always surprises me. Some of the areas that bother patients more than others. 
I have seen a large percentage of patients that are not bothered by vitiligo on their hands, which to me is, is actually surprising because it's a very That's visible right. area. The face is almost always the area they really want to treat, right? But then the hands are like, oh, it's my hands. I don't care. Uh, and then, you know, I want to make this clear again. Bring it up to your patients. I think, you know, we really we're really doing a disservice to our patients if we don't mention that there's a treatment for this because you'd be surprised. I have seen patients who... You know, they seem like they're not bothered by it. And when you mention it and bring it up, they'll say, you know, I wish I could wear a dress again. You know, I wish I didn't have to cover this up. And you'd be surprised because they're not talking about it. They're not bringing it up. If you bring it up, they are more likely to mention that. And you'll really find a lot of your patients are really distressed by their vitiligo. And if we can help our patients really change something for them, I think we're doing you know something that's great for our patients. We're being better clinicians, better people. And again, always ask. So I completely agree with Dr. Del Rosso ask where you want to treat because if i have vitiligo everywhere you know 10 percent. where do you want to treat you know face is almost universal and then a lot of times it's there you know their axilla they may not care about because it's hidden um sometimes the genitalia is an area that bothers them of course you know we know that vitiligo of the genital areas in some cultures could be quite a stigma so certainly an area that some patients are quite bothered by, and I've seen a lot of patients that that is a very important area for them to treat. We know that, of course, there are varying rates of repigmentation there, but we certainly can't see those results with those patients. Eric, you made my night. Finally, somebody agrees with me. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, and with that, you know, just a quick, you know, wrap up slide here. So again, we discussed it's the first and only FDA approved treatment for non-segmental vitiligo in patients 12 years of age and older. We talked about setting patient expectations. Repigmentation takes time and adherence is crucial to BID dosing. In phase three studies, we showed that one in three patients achieved f 75 at 24 weeks. But we also showed that one in two patients achieved f 75 at 52 weeks. So repigmentation does take time. And it is an appropriate treatment for all external areas, including sensitive areas, those eyelids, around the mouth, the face, the axilla, the body folds, wherever it may be, areas that traditionally we avoid topical steroid use on. And again, should not be used for ophthalmic, oral, or intravaginal use. We discussed the most common adverse reactions occurring in at least 1% acne, pruritus, nasopharyngitis, headache, UTI, erythema, and pyrexia. And with that, I thank you all, and I'm happy to take any questions. I know we had a very great discussion, Dr. Del Rosso, so I know we covered a lot of the very common questions, but if any other questions have come in, I am happy to answer those. So I don't know, actually, if we have any questions or where we are time-wise. Uh, with that, so I'll defer to you for that. It has been a dynamic program, and we are actually over time. So we will uh, make sure that the questions that have been submitted are given to the appropriate people so that we can get them answered for anyone. But we actually are out of time for Q and A Q&A tonight. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Del Ross. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Clinical. Great, great job and very thorough. And the experience is so important and it comes through. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.